Thank you. What a great welcome. And I'm the last speaker. I am amazed. Winnipeg is filled with friendly people. Tonight we're going to talk about baby brains and how they recover. It's been my abiding passion throughout my life. And I have to sort of admit that it's taken most of that career to actually figure out what it's all about. And what it's all about is what I think is probably the next big thing in pediatric neurorehabilitation. It is the awareness, the growing awareness, that babies' brains do recover, but they recover differently than adults do after a similar injury. And we have a growing awareness of the importance of early habits and how they confuse the picture. In order to start, I'm going to introduce you to two special people. This is Christine, who is obviously an adult and obviously has some difficulties walking. This is also Christine doing a forehand volley drill on the tennis court. Now, do you find that hard to believe that that's actually the same person walking with poor balance and doing a better forehand volley than me? This is little Jenna, who was born with a paralyzed left arm. And she has great difficulty getting her arm up. And you can see that she distorts her whole body in order to try and do what I've asked her to do. Yet by just asking her to do it differently, by asking her to do jumping jacks, you see that she's perfectly capable of getting both of her arms up, a different instruction and a different outcome. Poor little Jenna, with her arm not working, had been asked hundreds of times to lift her arm up, and she learned that lift position early on before her nerve had actually had a chance to recover. Equally, Christine, who was born with cerebral palsy, learned to walk when her brain was in the process of recovery. Looking at Christine's walk, or looking at Jenna's lift, as a doctor, I was trained to only see the problem that was there in front of me. Look at Christine now playing tennis, or Jenna doing jumping jacks, I see an entirely different brain. And the truth and the simplest explanation of what's going on is that these individuals learned lower order, early motor skills like walking when their brain was still damaged. And they learned their higher order skills, like look at that stance on Christine. It's ridiculously good. Not only is she up there waiting for the ball to come for an overhead smash, but she's even got her other arm out there waiting, bringing the ball into her racket. This is terrific stuff. But she learned those skills with a different brain. Both of them learned their early movements abnormally when their brains were damaged. They, they couldn't do it any other way. But their later skills were normal. Now, I'm going to take you on a little sort of tour through my life. And this is Psych 101, McGill University, more years ago than I ever want to talk about, <laughs> where D.O. Hebb taught me that expectations determine perception, or you see what you expect to see. Now, how many of you, you're going to have to wave at me because I can barely see you, how many of you see a young woman? And how many see the old woman? Now, you see, I told you I liked Winnipeg. You guys are positive. Now, for those who had a little difficulty, that image accentuates the young woman. And if you look at that and then look at it put back together again, it's easy to see that the young woman is looking backwards over her shoulder. This image accentuates the old woman who's looking off to the left side of the screen. And when you put her back together, you now should be able to flip 
back and forth. So look at the young woman, now the old woman. Now the young woman, now the old woman. And what you do, if you can actually manage it, and I won't ask because you'll lie. <laughs> but if you can manage it, and flip back and forth, you are demonstrating the amazing power of the human brain because the slide's not changing. The only thing that is happening is you are changing what you expect to see. Now, I like the young woman better because people who see the young woman tend to see a half full glass. And unfortunately, the few of you who saw the old woman, guess what? you see it half empty. Our challenge in pediatric neurorehabilitation is to not just look at what we expect to see. When I see a child, I read a chart and the child has cerebral palsy. I expect to see abnormalities in that child's movement. But even though that early skill set may be abnormal, the later skills may be very normal. And that's what I mean when I say that we have to learn to see beyond the expected. I expect to see problems because I was taught in medical school that injuries to the brain were permanent and irreversible. And it was really hard to understand, but that teaching was wrong. Over the past 20, 10 to 20 years, there's been a growing acceptance of human neuroplasticity. In the old days, we thought that human brains were too smart to fix themselves, and I'll explain that later. But neuroplasticity has changed some of our most cherished beliefs, and we haven't had a talk tonight about how much humans hate change, but trust me, they do. So imagine if you've in a field, and I was in this field, still am, where the founding principle, i.e. human brains don't get better, is shown to be wrong. It means that you have to stop and start re-examining every single thing in your mindset. But we now do understand, as you heard earlier tonight, that human brains can regrow, rewire, and reallocate function throughout life, but not in children. And that's the real problem, because this new belief and understanding in neuroplasticity does not seem to apply to children. Let me explain. Neuroplasticity is pretty widely accepted in adult neurology and stroke rehabilitation. And if I, with my nice white hair, had a mild stroke, I would expect to have full recovery. But all of the current teachings still say that if I'm a baby with exactly the same brain damage, I'm going to have cerebral palsy for life. Does that make sense? Not to me. I think it's counterintuitive and at worst, it's almost illogical. How can an old deteriorating brain like mine be better than a young growing brain. I mean, it's ludicrous. All of the scientific data, you know, often in our beliefs, just to, trans to flip away for a second, we all have cherished beliefs. And I believe that baby human brains can get better. It's really reassuring when all the science is on your side. <laughs> And that's what this situation, because adult animal brains get recover, baby animal brains recover better than adults, and adult human brains recover as well. So what the science tells us, that in all animal species, it's a universal rule from rats to monkeys, baby brains and nerves do better than adults. And the only question we have to ask is, is that true in humans? Well, I'm old. I don't have time to do 20 years of randomized controlled trials. So I'm just going to prove my point with a case study. How's that for chutzpah? 
I'm going to talk to you about a child who's three years old with chronic focal encephalitis. She was absolutely normal until she was stricken with a disease that caused an inflammation in the left side of her brain, severe seizures, loss of language skills, and a severe right-sided hemiplegia with tight tone in her right arm and her right leg. Medicine didn't work. So the surgeons got at her. And you don't have to be a neurosurgeon to figure out that this brain really has a problem. They've taken out the entire left side of her cortex. The part of her brain that controls speech and language and movement on the right side. Now, would you agree with me that if she gets better, there is such a thing as baby brain neuroplasticity? Come on, say yes or no. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> she's got half a brain. Now, this child is now, was reported when she was seven years old. The child who had lost her language skills is now fluently bilingual in Turkish and Dutch. Her right hemiplegia has resolved. She just has a little tiny tightness in her arm and leg, but nothing that interferes with her getting on with a normal life. Her seizures are also gone. With half a brain, she has, at a relatively old age, between age three and age seven, completely recovered from the surgery. So I think that proves baby brain neuroplasticity. And all the neurosurgeons agree with me, because hemispherectomy, taking out half a brain, is a well-known neurosurgical technique, and they know how good their results are. That may have something to do with their egos, but nonetheless. <laughs> As a pediatrician, we don't take out half a brain, and I didn't know about hemispherectomy patients until far longer in my career. I thought neurologic damage was permanent and irreversible. So when I had, I was a neonatologist, this is an early ult ultrasound scan of a baby's brain. You'll see a little butterfly-like object in the center, which is mildly dilated ventricles. They're not very important. They went away and resolved without any problem. But on the right side of his brain, you see messy echo densities with little holes all the way through and one whopping big hole. So when I saw those holes in his brain, I was absolutely convinced. He had holes in his brain on the right side. And so he was going to have, on the right side, <laughs> the other right side, <laughs> on this right side. He had holes in the right side of his brain, and he was going to have a left hemiplegia. I was absolutely convinced of that, and it was reassuring that I was absolutely right. He had a mild hemiplegia. I expect children with hemiplegia to walk badly, to have poor balance. And so when his mother told me he was playing soccer, I frankly didn't believe her. Did I mention that doctors are also arrogant, along with <laughs> neurosurgeons? I was wrong. I'm willing, I'm old enough, I can admit it. I was wrong. He was playing on a competitive under eight soccer team. And when mother told me about the four competitive tryouts, I still didn't believe her. So she took me out in the hallway and she got her son to tear down the hallway, fortunately it was empty, turn around, come back. So the first time he went down and came back, he was running with a perfect four-point, you like this, slow motion, <laughs> jog. He was going a whole lot faster than me. But what really blew me away was when he got to the ends of the hallway, he did perfect, absolutely perfect pivot turns. And sure, he could do it on the right side, but he was also doing it on his hemiplegic leg. And this one kid, was my aha moment, because it made absolutely no sense. 
you walk and you run with the same part of your brain. Trust me, I'm a doctor. I know these things. It's the same part of the brain. But this child could run, but not walk. And I'm embarrassed to say, it took me years to figure this out. It drove me nuts. And I finally worked out that that abnormal walk is nothing but a habit. If he can run normally, his brain is normal. My doctor diagnosis of hemiplegia was correct, but the coach's diagnosis of a good little soccer player was also correct. We both saw what we were trained to see. So baby brains do recover, but all those messy little early habits interfere with it. There we go. So habits are formed when you do anything repetitively. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And it's a known fact by anybody who does any athletic training that you can't change that habit by working the habit. Working the habit would be like telling a golfer who's got a bad slice where the ball goes charging off to the right to go out and practice a hundred slices before they play golf and expect the golf to be better. And in the way we do rehabilitation, it's a similar problem because we have a kid who can walk badly and we encourage them to walk more, which only teaches them to walk badly better. <laughs> the neuroscientists have told us that the way that we change habits are novelty, challenge, and focus. Because it takes more brain to learn something new than to do a habit. So I took Christine, the adult that you saw at the very beginning, and decided that she was the ultimate challenge because she had been walking abnormally for a very long time. But she's also a university graduate, CEO of two not-for-profit organizations that work with disabled children. She's intelligent, she's gutsy, she's motivated, and she wanted to change. So the first thing I did was prove to her that she could change. Now this is Christine walking forwards. And you can see how she swings that right leg around. Now then, she thought I was nuts, I asked her to walk backwards. And do you see where that leg is now? It's right underneath her pelvis, and she's standing straighter, and she's actually walking better. So if anybody really doesn't believe me yet that you run and walk with the same parts of the brain, you've got to accept the idea that when you walk forwards, you're using exactly the same part of your brain as when you walk backwards. We developed a program for her of periodic intensive training, and we had to train her out of her habit, because remember, we didn't want to train her to do bad better. So in order to do that, I took her out of gravity and put her in the water with a flotation device that allowed her to do deep water jogging. And this is Christine early on in a wet vest. And what do you think about her legs? It's really pretty good, isn't it? She is jogging normally, proving that her brain and all of those pathways are intact and working. We had to get her out of gravity to see it, and we had to have her doing perfect practice because Vince Lombardi said, and he was the boss, that practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And here is Christine practicing perfectly. This is two years later after countless hours in the water jogging, and jogging extraordinarily well. The program to take her on from this to walking independently on land had to be done in stages. So the first thing was jogging in the water. She's even got resistance weights to make it harder. 
And then we started her walking and doing walking drills in the water with a buoyancy barbell. Here she's doing a high knee walk. And here she's just doing perfectly normal steps with only a pole for balance. At the end, I got her to do a little mini squat just to activate the muscles that I wanted her to practice. And here, we transited her over to land. Now, here she's doing a one-step mini squat forehand volley drill. And she's not very steady. The reason this is so difficult for her is a one-step drill is very close to walking. So she's near her habit. This is a much tougher drill. She's doing a one, two, three mini squat backhand volley and she's actually doing it better. Because habits are hard to change, but the more novel the task is, the more brain you bring to the, to the party and the easier it is to change. When, remember Christine, who walks with difficulty, and Christine, who plays tennis better than I can. I think the challenge that we have facing us now is to stop thinking like doctors and start treating the child or the adult more like a world-class athlete. Doctors look for problems. Coaches look for possibilities. And as closing, I want to thank Christine, who was the adult who did all the work, who took the risk to beat down the negative expectations. Thank you.